Today, I get to review a really special lens, Nikon's new 135S Plena. I've been shooting with it both at home and abroad in the Scottish Highlands, and I will walk you through a bunch of sample images and tell you what I think of it. Well, hey everyone, it's Hudson. Welcome to this week's video. Uh, we're gonna talk a fair bit about this new 135S Plena lens that Nikon happily dropped on my doorstep the day before I took off for the Scottish Highlands uh, doing a scouting mission with my crew. And, uh, and I got a chance to really work it out a fair bit on that trip, as well as some stuff around home, like trick-or-treating with my kids and dark conditions. Uh, all kinds of fun outfits and stuff. So I'm gonna go through a lot of images in this video. We're gonna talk about what's special about this lens. It is a fantastic portrait lens. You know, I, I think that if you're a working portrait photographer whose bread and butter is headshots, you should just rush to buy this lens. Not so sure for the street photographer, the person like me, travel landscape, uh, occasional, you know, putting people in the scene, street shooting, it, it's a little trickier lens for that. And we'll kind of get to my final conclusions about this lens and whether it's sticking with me at the end of the video. Um, they also, Nikon dropped off the, the ZF body for me right before leaving for Scotland. And so I've shot a fair bit both with the Z9 and with the ZF. Uh, with this lens and with other lenses, I'll talk a little bit about the ZF at the end of this video. Uh, spoiler alert is that I really love it. I love it. Um, before we launch in and we start talking about all the characteristics of this lens, especially comparing it to my beloved 105 1.4 F-mount lens on the FTZ adapter, uh, I just want to highlight, you know, we're having office hours, a big free group photography get-together meeting. You can jo join live on Zoom or YouTube or watch it re-aired on YouTube. And we're going to be going through your your best images of 2023. So you can sign up for that and submit an image at this link. You can also just go ahead and click on this video's full description title, show more, and run over to hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. Um, and we'll be giving away some prizes to those images that we think really, really are outstanding and deserving. So sign up, submit an image, and I hope I'll see you there December 5th. That's a Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, if you can join live. All right. So this lens, this lens is a special one. Uh, it, it has basically a lot of the same characteristics that I love in my 105 1.4. Just the ability to isolate a subject, blow the background to smithereens, big, juicy, beautiful bouquet. You know, it's, um, it's got actually this interesting habit of turning all of the out of focus details into circular uh, circles of confusion, whereas my 105 1.4, especially around the edges, tends to create sort of lemon-shaped, you know, football-shaped out-of-focus rendering. This one really is pretty spectacular at the way it has smooth, clean, round circles of confusion. And you'll see that in the, in the images that I'm about to show. Um, in fact, why don't we just jump in and I'll look at some images from this lens uh, that I took both home and abroad in the Scottish Highlands. And then we'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more, particularly how it stacks up against the 105 and, and my thoughts on who this lens is for and who it's not for. All right, so as promised, I've got a bunch of images just to run through and look at. Taken with the Plena, taken with my 105 1.4 and also with Nikon's amazing 85 1.2 S lens. But we'll start off with images that I captured in Scotland with the Nikon ZF, the new body. Uh, I'm just going to jump in. I'll show you some of these images. All of them in Scotland are with the Plena with the 135. And you can see my settings up here. You know, shooting a lot at 1.8. Um, a lot of times auto ISO was sort of the way I was running in manual mode. And I'd have to have a high shutter speed to deal with that, you know, 1.8 aperture. Uh, but this is on the, the streets uh, uh, of, of Fort William, which is kind of near Glencoe, beautiful valley in the highlands of uh, Scotland. And just, you know, it, it gives you a little sense you can, you can, you know, you can use this to reach out in street photography and capture candid moments on the street without people noticing so much. You get beautiful image separation, you know, subject separation from the background. Um, I love the way the street sort of fades out here so smoothly. 1.8 is just beautiful with this lens. Getting a little closer uh, to Rick, Rick being my, uh, my workshop coordinator and one of my best friends on the planet. Uh, he's thinking about 
shots with his Q2 there. I was on the trip uh, also with David Archer, wildlife landscape photographer extraordinaire, and our good buddy Charlie Johnson. Uh, so you'll see a lot of those guys. Um, again, you know, we're getting in there. This lens is just the dream lens for photographing headshots. The way it just turns that background to butter. Um, and again, you know, you can do a longer shot of people. They have no idea you're doing it. Here's Rick photographing the street there. David, uh, David noticed me photographing him using his iPhone uh, up above uh, one of the, the old castles that we saw near the bridge onto the Isle of Skye. Um, let the other guys play around with it a bit. I think this was actually maybe Charlie taking a photo of me um, up there in that same area beautiful sort of overcast day. You know, it's probably not what the lens is intended for, but it isolates whatever subject you have. And there are plenty of sheep in the Scottish Highlands. You can see, you know, making use of that 1.8 aperture on just about every single one of these shots, you know. So if you got 1.8 on a 135, why not use it? <clears throat> I thought I'd kind of test how different apertures looked with it. You know, here's 1.8 on this fence post that had like this little macro world inside of it. And I wondered, you know, how, how close can I get? Well, this is about as close as I could get focused. It's not quite that macro focusing machine uh, that the 100 to 400 is or the new 180 to 600. But you can get nice and close and isolate little little details in the macro world. You know, here we are at 1.8, and then I stop down a little bit to 2.8. Still a nice, beautiful blurb background. Um, F4, also, you know, looking nice. You start to see some of the details, but they're pretty creamy in the background. You know, these out-of-focus details in the hillside. Coming up to f5.6, it starts to get, you know, not that much different than if you were stopping down with a different lens. You get a little bit more of your macro world in focus here, but... Coming to f8, it starts to look like any kind of normal lens, not such beautiful details in the background. I mean, that's just to be expected. The fact that you can use that 1.8 and isolate that little subject, that, that's pretty special. Um, you know, what about just taking landscape photos with it? Well, you know, of course, you can stop it down to f11 and get that background sharp, get your subject sharp. This is the Castle Eileen Danon that we were up above near the bridge onto the Isle of Skye. You know, foreground to background, all looking fine. But I could also do this at 135 millimeters with my 100 to 400, or at 120 millimeters with my, you know, 24 to 120 lens. Um, you know, there's nothing unique and special about the 135 in that situation. It really, to me, is using it at those wider apertures and lower light or getting that subject background separation. Although I was out banging around with it in Glasgow and there was this beautiful arena. They were having a rock concert there that night, lots of people. And in blue hour and really pretty low light, I shot this at f1.8 handheld as a pano with, you know, I think seven overlapping frames. And, you know, at 1.8 out there at infinity, it did a fine job. Um, so, you know, it's, it's certainly versatile enough. I wondered how it dealt with backlight and extreme backlight situations. We were on the Isle of Skye for the sunset out at Nist Point where there's a, a beautiful light, well, not such a beautiful lighthouse, but a beautiful landscape with a lighthouse in it. Uh, and as we were kind of wrapping up the day, we were out there with some of the, the guys from, Night, from Nia Evo, backpacks, which I had a blast with them in Scotland. That's a whole nother story. Look for, for more details about that. But I saw this couple walking out to take a selfie at sunset together. Um, and I had the 135 on, and I just, you know, on the ZF by the car, and I got as close as I could and got these shots thinking, well, this is a nice test, you know? So I'm at, you know, F5, F11, you know, F10, F11. Not much ghosting, not much flare, doing a fine job with a very intense point source of light, the sun right there. So nice job with the coatings. That's kind of what Nikon's been doing with all of the new glass. You know, I think it just bears saying though that this, is a headshot lens. You know, here's Rick at the Kerang, Kerang and David in Glasgow in a beautiful neighborhood with fall color. Um, it just shines for headshots. David's wife, if she sees this, is gonna hate it. Paul is not digging him, uh, growing the scruff out on our trip, but uh, I thought he looked great. So, surprise, surprise.
And you know, here's something that bears remembering when you're working with any of sort of my favorite long, wide aperture primes, whether it's the 8512 or the 10514 or this 13518. You're gonna photograph two people, make sure you stop down a little bit. You shoot this at 1.8, you know, Rick's eyes will be even more out of focus looking. You know, it's it's tricky enough getting both eyes in focus. Put two people together, you gotta to make sure you get enough stop down that uh, that you're gonna get everybody that you need in focus, or at least in focus enough. And as we showed with our fence post shots in that little macro world, it still is pretty beautiful down to about f4 in the way it renders out of focus details in the background, uh, which is unique about this lens. You know, and it still, it lets you take some unique images. You know, here we are again in Glasgow, and, and you know, that 1.8 aperture lets it be all about Rick, you know, and in this strange place at the Science Museum or Charlie walking the tunnel that leads into that uh, big concert hall. It looks almost like he's an astronaut walking into the shuttle launch port. I, I love this shot. And it, it, I mean, the way it separates the subject from the background, you know, at, this is again at f1.8, you can see here, it just makes it almost feel like he's on a blue screen punched out. It's just so darn sharp with such a massive separation between subject and background. Um, in Glasgow, in the dark of night, playing around full moon, you know, some of the, the statuary on a bridge near the University of Glasgow. And it was near Halloween weekend, so it felt a little eerie and spooky and putting some of these gothic figures with the moon in the background through the clouds or, you know, Halloween revelers out in the alleyways and the restaurants and the bars. It was just fun to be working with this lens in low light. And that leads us to the day I got home, well, the day after I got home, but I was still so jet lagged. I had Halloween with the kids at what felt like 3 a.m. Uh, the day after arriving home, here's Pike done up as a snake. And I thought, you know, what better way to test the Plena uh, with the Z9 than to take it out with my kiddos. And it's certainly capable of handling that, that 47 megapixels from the Z9. Uh, Pepper being a bit dramatic here. My, my baby girl, she was done up as a mummy. Uh, and even though she had her warm uh, Patagonia coat on, she, she, her theatrics made it, you know, she was good at doing the mummy thing. People had no question about what she was. This is our, uh, one, one of their, um, Pike's second grade buddy's little sister and our good friend's daughter, Sybil. She was done up as a dinosaur, so cute. One of Pike's classmates, Otto. Otto's dad making sure that the adults were having a good time and Halloween too. <laughs> Thomas cracks me up. One of our neighbors, were, the, the family was all done up as Super Mario Brothers and this little girl was just adorable. Pepper, here's where you start to see those, those out of focus circles of confusion from the Plena lens. They are just beautiful. The bouquet from this lens, when you have those out of focus lights in the background, they just render beautiful, you know, again, subject background separation. This is our, our, our little friend Axel running away from getting some candy. Otto and Pike. Look at even the little lights in this scene are just rendering beautifully. Pepper in kind of a, a dry ice smoke with beautiful background. One of the neighbors that really did it up for Halloween. Axel. Our good friends Brooke and Megan, that's, that's our, our good friend Evan and Sybil's mom and dad and uh, Thomas in the background there. And you know, you just find a little bit of light and that's all this lens needs. We're at 10,000 ISO here, really, really dark, standing at 50th of a second with that amazing in-body image stabilization in the Z9 combined with the Plena's image stabilization and that 1.8 aperture lets you still get a great image in those darkened conditions. And again, you know, just the way that it renders the out of focus details. So I thought, you know, let's take a, sh a couple of shots of my daughter Pepper on our porch the next day. Z9, you know, we're looking at the full res 47 megapixel file here. This is the 135 with my sort of string lights on the porch at dusk as the backdrop. Wide open f1.8, 100 ISO. Here's the one, uh, 105.1.4, wide open, 160 ISO, also just sharp as can be. Now, as I said, you know, you take a look at the out of focus rendering, it's not perfectly sharp circles of confusion or not perfectly round, but you know, the, the 105 definitely is rendering some sort of footballs, some lemons. 
uh, throughout the frame even really, but you know, still beautiful. I remember when I first got this lens and took pictures like this, I was just blown away. Stepping back a little bit, here's the Plena, the 135, gorgeous. Here's the 105. God, I still love it. You get a little bit more view of the porch. You can see this is one of the beams. Uh, you know, you try to get the same size subject. I get a little more of the world. I'm seeing one of the corbels on my porch gable and one of the one of the posts along with one of the beams. A little bit more, a little bit more of the background. And again, I'm a little bit closer, or quite a bit closer actually. I don't have to be as far away at 135. And I'll just throw in an example between the 105 and the 8512. So, you know, let, let's look once again at the circles of confusion from the Plena lens, and then we'll have a look at the 8512. I'd say the Plena wins out. The closer you get to the edge, it has beautiful, pretty round uh, circles of confusion, but the closer you get out to the edge, you start having very similar to the 105 1.4. It goes into those lemon shapes. It doesn't bother me that much. I know, you know, everybody's after perfection these days, and Nikon seems to have delivered it with the Plena. And, you know, here you see the one, the 85 1.2. Here it is compared the same moment with my boy Pike with the 105 1.4, you know. And again, a little tighter view of the world. I can be a little bit further away. Um, this, these were taken without me moving my feet. So you see the sort of zoom factor of the 105 versus the 85. Also a smaller view of the back of my house there. Um, but again, you know, I think that our clear, um, clear bouquet rendering lens champion is the 135 1.8. Um. All right, so I think without a doubt you can see that I, I, I loved using this lens um, and I, 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 I think, you know, if, if I had all the room for lenses in the world and unlimited resources, there's no doubt I would be keeping this lens. But the reality is my 105 1.4 has served me so well. It focuses darn near as quickly. It's beautifully sharp in the portion of the image that's sharp. It has gorgeous bokeh, and it's about the same size and weight when you put the FTZ adapter on it. It's a lighter lens when it's on its own without the FTZ adapter. With the FTZ adapter, it weighs a couple ounces more. It's negligible. They're almost identically sized. That's a big difference from the 85 1.2 that I tested and compared to the 105 1.4 um, earlier this year. Actually, I was lucky with that lens too. It arrived right before going to Cuba and I was able to test it on the streets of Cuba. Um, you can see that video, I'll put a link right here and again in this video's description if you want to see the sort of the, the review of the 85 1.2 it is a much larger um, physically heavier lens a bit of a bear to carry around wonderful wonderful lens again i think you know if you're a portrait photographer <laughs> i think that this lens is out of focus rendering and its subject separation from the background is just unrivaled with the way that it does it it's spectacularly beautiful for those People like me who tend to work a little bit more candid, a little more street work, your travel, landscape, you know, it's a little tougher to work with 135 millimeters. You know, it's a really a headshot lens. It shines photographing headshots. Sure, you can isolate a subject out on the street and totally separate it from the background at a certain distance. You can do that same thing with the 105 1.4 without being quite as far away from the subject. That was my problem, was that more often than not, I found myself sort of running away from the subjects I wanted to photograph because I was too close and they were too frame filling. Um, 135 is a pretty narrow, narrow reach when you're out photographing people candidly in the landscape or doing street photography. So for me, in comparing all the lenses that I've compared, there's the 85 1.2, which was spectacular but big and heavy. And sometimes I had to get a little closer to subjects than I wanted to surreptitiously shooting in the street or trying to get candid moments. There's the 135 1.8, which you know is not quite as great in dark, dark situations and almost a little too frame filling. You have to back up a little more that I want from subjects. And then there's kind of the Goldilocks lens, which I still just adore. You saw the sample images. I mean, it, it doesn't have the perfectly round circles of confusion but they're beautiful. And for someone like me, that I'm just literally wanting those abilities to, to sub separate my subjects from the background to have a little bit more discreet street shooting lens, the 105 focal length is just a focal length that I personally love. The other great thing about it is I just did an eBay search 
And with the 85 1.2s release and this 135 1.8, a lot of people are getting rid of their used 105 1.4s. You stick this on the FTZ adapter and you can easily get one for less than $1,000 for you know half what I paid for this back when it was the king of the long prime wide aperture lenses that Nikon made. It still has a, it, this, is, this is just a special, special lens, the 105 1.4. So sad as I am, I'm putting this one back in the box. I've been very careful with it. It's pristine and like new, and I'm gonna ship it on back to b and I'm putting a link to this lens though. If you're a portrait photographer, if what you love is taking headshots of people, then by all means, you know, I, I, I can't imagine a better tool for that purpose. I think you've seen in the images that I've shown, it's wonderful. It focuses laser fast and it is spectacular at separating that subject from the background and making it all about your subject. It performs beautifully on the Z9. It performed beautifully on the ZF. I'm sure that as a higher megapixel camera comes out in the not so distant future, it didn't seem like it was challenged at all at 47 megapixels. I'm sure they designed it for, well, I'm gonna guess 100, but you know, I would imagine that there'll be some larger megapixel cameras coming out, maybe a Z7 II successor in the 60 something megapixel range in 2024. That's total crystal ball. I don't have an accurate one, but that's my guess. Let's talk just really briefly, because I promised about the ZF. Um, special camera, I think it's designed largely for people like me who shot in the old manual film camera days. I had an FM3A, was the last camera I sold that I really regret. I sometimes still look at them online. This camera has that feel, that FM2, FM3A feel to it. I love the dials. I love the way that it feels. It's a solid, well-built, weather-sealed camera. It auto-focuses fast and accurately. It doesn't have the speed for sports action and wildlife that you're gonna get from a Z8 or a Z9. There's no way, you know, it's using the old Z6 sensor that's in the Z62 and the Z6. You know, I think that if you're doing uh, metered focused shooting, you're gonna top out around eight seconds frame rate if you're doing the hybrid shutter, both electronic shutter and physical shutter. The physical shutter in this thing sounds superb. I mean, it's, it's hard to overstate. It just sounds amazing. Um, and it just, working particularly with a, a manual focus lens, this camera has some crazy technology built in that's a showcase of what's coming for Nikon. Um, the, the eight stops of in-body image stabilization. I was hand-holding images of a waterfall at normal range, you know, 50 to 70 millimeters at a half a second, braced a little bit, you know, and I'd fire off a burst and then I'd review the images and every frame from start to finish was sharp except for the blurred water at a half a second. That's just crazy. Handheld half second waterfall shooting um, and not with ultra wide angle. Uh, it, it really has just crazy in-body image stabilization and it can allow you to focus the in-body image stabilization on outer focus points that you've selected. So not just the center of the sensor, the outer points can be the focus of the in-body image stabilization. It also has manual eye detect autofocus. What does that mean? Well, that means if I mount a lens, I, when this camera was announced, I reordered my beloved 51.0 Voigtlander to test this with, but it'll see the eyes of your subjects if you're in, you know, auto area or wide area, any of the wide area modes, or the 3D mode, you can direct it to the eye that you're interested in, it'll come up as a box, and when you focus, it'll go green, the box around the eye. You can switch which eye you're watching, and then you can hit the OK button if you program it, just pop in and it'll keep that eye centered in the frame as you perfect focus on the eye. That's nuts, I don't know of any other camera in the world that does that with manual focus lenses. So it makes it a dream come true for people that have legacy lenses that they love. Uh, and, and it's just a special camera to shoot with old school manual focus lenses. But then again, you slap your 24 to 120 or your 100 to 400 on it and then boom, I was keeping birds in flight. You know, it has that same processor as the Z8 and Z9 and 3D. Uh, and all the area detection modes, and it's, it's superb at tracking action. Again, doesn't have the same frame rate, doesn't have the ability to use an electronic shutter to insane speeds like those cameras do. It maxes out at 8,000th of a second. So, you know, it's, it's for a certain purpose, and it's designed to appeal either to the old school camera lover like myself, or to some of the new generation who really likes the retro design look and feel. 
This one they, they did a fantastic job on. And I'll be doing more videos about it. There's a little bit of a challenge to getting it set up. I did a large amount of customization of the controls of this camera to make it feel intuitive and do everything that I need it to do easily. Uh, and I'll be sharing those settings and setup videos and a full review of this camera in the not so distant future. So just look out for that. All right, everybody. I had a blast in Scotland. There'll be more content from Scotland coming. Uh, the workshop will be getting released for Scotland. I know we have a lot of interest and demand for that already. I'm, I'm sure it's going to go like that, but it's going to be an amazing, amazing, amazing workshop. We had such a great time there. I think you can see from a few of the pictures, um, and I'll share a lot more in the weeks ahead. So lots of fun stuff coming up. I hope everyone out there... Oh, and remember, we're doing that look through your best photos of 2023 in the office hours, December 5th, 10 a.m., Sign up over at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. That link is in this video's full description, along with links to the Plena lens and the ZF camera. And I'll throw a link into this 51.0 Voigtlander, which I adore. Uh, if you want to know why, click this link right here. I'll put that link in the description too on my review of the Voigtlander Primes for Nikon Z special lens. It just is. It's one of those special primes. Uh, but for me, more usable. So, all right. Uh, stay safe, stay creative. I hope you're out there having fun, enjoying fall weather here in the Northern Hemisphere, spring weather in the South. It's a pretty great time of year for photographers. We'll see you next week.